Good evening, welcome to The Fix Live. My name's Aramis Tani. I'm John Bashsaka. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, man? I'm very good. There are some certainties in life. Uh, the autumn will always follow summer. Uh, the 48% will always believe that they are, in fact, a majority of British public opinion. That and your man will not text you back. That your man will not text you back. And that we in Avara Media will always, almost telepathically, be wearing black. What can I say? Um, we are talking about a few stories this evening. Ash and I. Ash is going to lead off with police uh, violence in a second. And then we'll go to a break. And then the second half of this evening will be joined by Richard Angel and Michael Walker talking all things Labour. But kicking us off, Ash, the so police. So I wanted to talk a bit about police violence, first in the UK and then in the US, because there's been a development in the Rashan Charles case. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar with this case, Rashan Charles was a young man who in Dalston was chased into a shop. Um, he was restrained by a police officer and also a member of the public. And following that police contact, he died. Now, it has not been established precisely how it is that he died. Initially, there were false reports that a controlled substance had been removed from his throat. So the implication being that he was um, dealing drugs and had swallowed the yeah. evidence. But the object that was removed from his throat, it's been put out um, through official channels that it was paracetamol and caffeine. So it certainly wasn't, you know, a kind of a, a bag of narcotics or anything like that. So the thing that's happened today is that the IPCC has said that it has recommended to Scotland Yard that the police officers involved should be taken off duty while a gross misconduct investigation takes place. Now, for the IPCC, which we know has largely been toothless in such cases around deaths following police contact, this is a fairly strong indication that there is something here that's gone dreadfully, fatally awry and needs opening up because another case from uh, just the summer gone, Edson da Costa in mm. Beckton, who died in a car following police contact. Again, a lot of rumour and conjecture swirling about how it was that happened. Um, there's been no such recommendation made. There's been actually very little information that's been made public. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because very often, if you do anything in police accountability activism or anti-racism more generally, one of the things that you hear again and again is, well, look, we're in the UK, you've got nothing to complain about, or that um, police violence in the UK is not a racialized problem. To which I would say, well, certainly the racial disparities are not quite as stark as in the US, although actually the availability of detailed federal data is sorely lacking in this regard. But I think one very jarring statistic is that the disparity in racialized incarceration, so the disparity between black people as a percentage of the population and the percentage of those who are in prison is greater than that in the US. And when it comes to accountability, well, since 1990, there have been over 1,565 deaths following police contact and not one single successful conviction. Whereas in the United States, at least, um, well, there's one study that says roughly 35% of police shootings are followed with some kind of conviction for fatal police shootings. I think that's a rather optimistic figure that comes from one study by uh, Philip Stinson of Bowling Green State University in Ohio. But again, that shows that there is at least some history of convictions. And what's more, in 2012, the Home Affairs Committee said that said as part of an inquiry into the IPCC that it's woefully under-equipped and hamstrung in achieving its original objectives. It has neither the power nor the resources that it needs to get to the truth when the integrity of the police is in doubt. So I'm opening up um, this as a discussion with you as well, is that do you think that anything has changed, not just since um, 2011 and the riots in England, but also last summer, where you saw Black Lives Matter shut down major transport hubs in protest of police violence, and it became mm. not just a national story, but a global story. Do you think anything meaningful has changed? I think it's become um, a more salient issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember listening to Andrew Castle on LBC Radio, and they were talking about Black Lives Matter. And that, that they didn't agree, necessarily, although he was actually very sympathetic. That's not really the point. It's, like I said, it's a salient political issue, and... It's in the public consciousness that some people, 
actually quite a few people, genuinely believe that racist policing extends not just to stop and search, not just to you know, longer sentencing or more likely to be found guilty uh, at trial, but actually to the loss of life. Mm. And I think that's become more salient in particular since we had lots of different cases. You know, John Menezes de Camp, uh, John, John de Menezes, sorry? Yeah, John um, Charles de Menezes. John Charles de Menezes, the Brazilian national that was killed um, in the first half of the 2000s. I what year it was. It was immediately following 7-7, uh, I think it was the next day or the day after. So 2005. Like Stockwell police station. Yeah, uh, not police station, chief station. Yeah, 2005. He, he jumped the barriers and uh, he was killed mm -hmm. uh, by a firearms unit. But I think in particular since the Mark Duggan stuff. Mm. Now, I'm not going to comment necessarily on what Mark Duggan did or didn't do. I personally don't think there was much of a case there. But irrelevant of that, I think because of the kickback, because of the consequences and the riots and so on, again, it made it a salient point. It was something that people had to talk about. And I think all of this, particularly in Britain anyway, is, is, is in that slipstream, so to speak. I mean, and let's talk about this and the corrosive effect it has on public trust. Now, if you go around the area that I grew up, so around North London, you talk to anyone about uh, the police, particularly in Tottenham, which where I spent a lot of my childhood, no one trusts them, mm. right? Absolutely no one, because, you know, very fresh in their minds is not just the history of Mark Duggan, but the events surrounding Broadwater Farm in the 80s. Um, actually, during the riots in 2011, because my uh, nan was living in Tottenham, which is the house that we lived in, and I rang her and I was like, oh, are you all right? Can you get to the shops all right? Da -da 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 -da. And she mm. was like, I'm fine. I was there for Broadwater Farm, and mm. by the way, if I didn't have a bad leg, I'd go get a new microwave. I was like, <laughs> I was like, Jesus, <laughs> drink more, Nan. Clearly suits you. Um, but thinking about this in terms of breakdown of public trust, so it's not just confined to, um, you know, you know, urban centres. It's now up and down the country, right? Because these cases are, you know, publicised far and wide. And the one thing mm. that anyone knows, whether you live in Tottenham or like Tunbridge <coughs> Wells or some shit, is yeah. that there's never any justice and there's never um, any form of accountability. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because of the case in um, St. Louis, Missouri. Yes. Obviously the site of protests in Ferguson, uh, much more famously. Uh, just the other day, Jason Stockley, a police officer who shot and killed Anthony Lamar Smith in 2011, was acquitted at trial of homicide. Now, one of the facts which is not in dispute is that he had said, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. Mm. He shot and killed a man, and mm. yet he was acquitted at trial. Mm. Now, there's been outbreaks of disturbances, um, protests. Uh, I think we're going to show a video of uh, just what happened when police were kind of approaching um, a group of protesters and a... Uh, you know, elderly woman this is was one, knocked yeah. to the ground. Yeah. Elderly woman, you see her just on In there. In red. That's it, on the yeah. right. And she's knocked over by a riot shield. Yeah. And, and then, then... No immediate medical assistance, just carry on. And look, anyone who's pepper gone spray. to help her out gets pepper sprayed and yeah. knocked over as well. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I wanted to bring this up is that, especially um, after Charlottesville there's been a lot of discussion about black bloc tactics and whether mm. or not they're alienating and, you know, whether or not such violence is ever justified. Mm. I think that video shows you what happens when there isn't a black bloc acting as a physical barrier between uh, encroaching police <clears throat> officers and, say, the less confrontational protesters. Mm. Now, I'm not saying masking up and running around is always the most effective tactic. There's been a few times where I've seen black bloc and there's like five people in a sea of otherwise normally dressed people and I'm like... Mm, it often you... tends to be quite, I don't know, sim purely symbolic, right? Sometimes it is a bit. It yeah. is a bit and, I'm, and, you know, I think that in some cases it's more about people saying something about themselves but I think in Charlottesville they were really the only effective force in kind of, you know, pushing back um, the violent alt-right and you saw what happened to people when they weren't uh, protected by that big mass of people. You saw that, you know, absolutely horrific beating of a man um, in a car park. But yeah, I wanted to kind of raise that as an example of what happens when you don't can have I, a black bloc. Can I quickly just feed back on that? So mm -hmm. with this older woman, clearly even a, a you know, a, a police officer either side of the Atlantic, nobody's going to say that it's appropriate force, right? First and foremost, it's clearly absolutely wrong. And so like you say, what's the, what's the solution to that? I've always said in a protest situation, if 
there is a misapplication of force. If it's inappropriate force, de-arrest them. Because what the police officer doing is illegal, okay? And if you obstruct an arrest and it goes to court and something, you know, obstruction is not, you're gonna get a 200 pound fine or whatever. But if you think that somebody's gonna get hurt, and uh, like I say, it's inappropriate, you're perfectly entitled to act as a citizen or rather in this country as a subject of a majesty. Regardless, uh, you can do something about it. And you know, that's horrific. That's the sort of thing that led to uh, the death of Ian Tomlinson. Um, not that long ago in London, complete misapplication of force. An older man who had a pre-existing heart condition, I believe, same with her, right? That, could, that can kill somebody. So if you see it, I would always say get involved. But similar things happen with um, Cynthia Jarrett, right? So this is a story that comes up time and time again, whether in the UK or the US. Um, so moving on, I know that there's something that you want to talk about. Me? Yeah. Oh, well, guess what? We're going to talk about Brexit. Ugh. We're going to talk about Boris. I sound like James O'Brien. Have you noticed that James O'Brien only talks about Brexit every day? And he thinks that, you know, today there's new converts. Broadly speaking, as we know, the statistics are static. Whichever side you're on, okay? Regardless, Brexit's particularly interesting now because it's made the, the path plausible for uh, Boris to return to the, the apex of Conservative Party politics and therefore the, the apex of British politics. He wrote a piece in the Telegraph, maybe we can just cut to this now, a 4,000 word essay in the Telegraph last Friday. Here we go. UK will still have access to sync. No, this is not it. This is the independent. We'll go to this in a second because I want to point out surprisingly a contradiction. No, no, that's Robert Halfen. Here. <laughs> no, come on. Getting come white on. guys mixed up with each other. Come on, guys. Which, oh, no, no, it's, um, <laughs> it's a Telegraph piece last Friday. And uh, here's the quote. Before the referendum, we all agreed on what leaving the EU logically must entail. He wrote this last Friday. Leaving the customs union and the single market, leaving the penumbra of the European Court of Justice, even though the ECJ precedes the European, it's not the EU, it's a different entity. Taking back control of our borders, cash, laws. I mean, our cash has nothing to do with the EU. I mean, I'm the first to say there are certain aspects of the EU which are undemocratic. Trade policy, for instance, but cash has nothing to do with the EU. This is the article here, uh, and it's, uh, it's basically a job application. He talks about the NHS. He talks about leaving the EU as potentially solving the housing crisis. I mean, I don't quite really get what he's saying there. If we can just cut to that other piece uh, from he the Independent. He also posted it on Facebook so that he wouldn't be inhibited by the Telegraph's paywall. Oh, Did wow. Did that? No, I didn't so, know that. Um, yeah, that's normally what Bad MPs man. do when Bad they're writing articles. They also post it on Facebook. Bad man, bullshit artist Boris. If we can go to that Independent article we just uh, saw a second ago. Um, so, yes. This is from last year. Headline, UK will still have access to single market despite Brexit. So last Friday, he's saying that the referendum's result clearly means leaving the single market. But this is what he said last year. This is the guy who wants to be the prime minister and how much he's changed in the space. This is in black and white, right? You can't say I never said it. You wrote it down. British people will still be able to go and work in the EU, to live, to travel, to study, to buy homes and to settle down. As the German equivalent of the CBI, the BDI, has very sensibly reminded us, there will continue to be free trade and access to the single market. That's from last June, okay? So, yeah, he's, uh, he's at it again. Uh, furthermore, in that piece on Friday, he talks about uh, that £350 million figure, which I thought they were all ashamed of, but I mean, apparently he's not. I instead chosen to reanimate this tap-dancing corpse, which is like the £350 million a week, which is not going into the NHS. Mm. What I'm wondering mm. is that we seem to live in an age where there is unprecedented evidence of when our politicians are lying, right? We always have the receipts. And yet there seems to be very little in the way of mechanisms for accountability, right? Of that actually ending a career or having any kind of detrimental effect whatsoever. Everyone knows Boris Johnson is a liar. He's actually not as funny as people think he is. And also he's a racist, which is, you know, probably the greatest of the three crimes, but mm. you know, whatever. Um, he, and also, yet, he also looks and like yet. a talking loaf of bread. <laughs> he actually looks like a loaf of bread. No, he looks like, you know them dogs which <laughs> look like mop heads? There's like a particular breed of dog that looks like a mop head. He looks like a, yeah, he looks no, like a dog that. that looks like an inanimate object and people think he's a serious candidate for Prime Minister. I mean... I'm not saying that you have to like, I don't have think a certain they do look anymore. to be Prime Minister. I, mean, I don't but... think they do anymore. I mean, this is something we'll get back to. Although that said, I thought the article on, on Friday uh, in The Telegraph, I thought it was actually okay. I thought it was quite good for a Tory, because they're obviously fucked. 
uh, and I thought it was hitting the right notes. And it, for me, we're going to see Theresa May's speech in Florence on Friday. And the content, this is a lot of smush. It means nothing, right? Mm -hmm. What he wrote. But it's going to be better than what she says next Friday. I mean, that's the thing is that, like, th this is a phrase that you love to use. And I have, you know, sort of absorbed and started repurposing for my nefarious purposes, which is you don't bring facts to an emotions fight. And the mm. thing is, is that, you know, I spent, you know, half an hour of my life that I'm never getting back reading this fucking warbly this, essay. This long read. Oh, God, a deep dive. <laughs> a deep dive into, like, the deepest recesses of the ruling class. Um, and when you look for what his, you know, concrete proposals for Brexit are, one mm. was just have a successful Brexit. Mm. Which to me seemed completely bananas. So it was, you know, somewhat light on policy, but there was enough broad brush emotive material, which in terms of his core audience, at least, was working. So there was a little roundup of Telegraph uh, readers' comments. And one of them was, if Boris was my boss during World War I, I would follow him over the top. I was like... Bitch, <laughs> are you telling me that World War I is remembered as a notoriously successful conflict? Mm. And are you saying that Brexit is going to make the Somme look comparatively successful? Mm. I mean, I don't know. I, well, I find this country very strange well, there's sometimes. The, there's the, the Blackadder joke. And Blackadder's told, he goes, you're going over the top tomorrow, Blackadder. And he goes, he goes, we'll be right behind you, 20 miles behind you. And this is precisely uh, a perfect metaphor for Brexit because... The ruling class are right behind us, but they're 20 miles behind us. They won't be facing the joblessness or the declining wages or, uh, yeah, increased inflation, a bunch of things. Uh, here we go. There's Black out of there. I mean, it tells you something about the imperial nostalgia, which kind of undergirds this whole hard Brexit project from Liam Fox saying the UK is the only EU country that doesn't have to bury its 20th century history. Is that <coughs> talking about the same 20th century, love? Or, indeed, Boris Johnson, who loves a colonial metaphor. Do you remember his conference speech last year? Like the gunboats of British soft yes. power going softly. I was like, jeez. Yeah. The, so there's this pitch in this article. The one substantive thing he says is there's a quote from Andy Haldane, who's the Bank of England's chief economist. He says, quote, We should seize the opportunity of Brexit to reform our tax system. Andy Haldane, the Bank of England's chief economist, argued in 2015 that our system is currently skewed so as to discourage investment. He believes that reform could raise output by around 20%. Andy Haldane believes that 40% of jobs will be lost due to automation in the next 20 years. The same guy. I actually think it may even be the same speech. So if you think leaving Brexit is the solution to mass technological unemployment and what I view as the basis of a potential transition to fully automated luxury communism, then fine. <laughs> I mean, I think you've got something very badly wrong there. We're going to wrap up. I want to quickly go, though, on this same story to... That was the Halfen story. We got out previously, the Telegraph story. Uh, he's uh, Robert Halfen's a senior Conservative MP. He's, uh, he's quite a rare animal in so, in so much as he has a modicum of sense. Uh, let's get that piece up. He was uh, interviewed by House Magazine, and uh, he said, I'm normally an incrementalist. I'm not a confrontational politician. But I actually think we need a radical, counterintuitive revolution in the Conservative Party if we are to survive. He goes on to say, If we don't radically reform our messaging, our machinery, if we don't focus on policies that are really there to help the lower paid, which is supported by people in metropolitan areas, I think we'll face a precipice. Corbyn will be in number 10. Uh, I think that's entirely correct. Um, and I think between that half on peace and Boris's long read, his deep dive, mm -hmm. You have the smoke and mirrors with Boris and you have the reality of what's going on with the Conservative Party. Um, and of course, sometimes in the media it's difficult to glean one from the other. Uh, but there's one statistic in particular, and I'll leave uh, viewers with this before we go to a break, is that the average Conservative Party member is now 72 years old. 72 years old. Now, I've got nothing against older people. Right? A political party should have people of all ages. But that's not... That's not good, right? That's not positive. Also, hasn't the um, average age um, been going up yeah. actually at a pace that's like faster than time? So it's like, you know, in the past two years gone up by like six years yeah. or something like that, which is, yeah. you know. That's exactly right. And it's getting smaller as well. Um, so the last time the Conservatives released data in regards to their membership was the end of 2013, and it was 150,000. And in 2014, 2015, there were whispers of it being 100, 120,000. What we know is that a lot of members left after the same-sex uh, gay marriage uh, bill, I think 2013 or 2012, was passed. A lot of Tory members left in the run-up to that and subsequent to it, and that's probably just carried on. And 
I would wager there's fewer than 100,000 members in the Conservative Party. That's a bit of, I like a bet. It may not be correct, but if it is over 100,000, it's not much over 100,000. So what do you think? In terms of re-engaging the youth, they should have an Activate 3.0? Well, and we will leave on this because I keep on saying this. There was a piece, uh, yes, uh, in the Guardian talking about this review that's been led by Eric Pickles, of all people talking about how we can, they can renew and reinvigorate the Conservative Party. And one was, uh, we need a, a youth organisation. And then, this made me laugh, because I, I knew that the Tories are, are kind of strange people, but uh, the Activate WhatsApp messages, uh, which, by the way, are completely real, Evolve Politics did a three-part... Um, expose. Expose, precisely. Thank you, Ash. English graduate here. Uh, the stupid political scientists. <laughs> we get everything wrong. Um, they did a three-part expose on um, Evolve, and it included these terrible WhatsApp messages, right, which even Conservatives would, I hope, not agree with. But there, there's a broader context there that's not in a vacuum. Uh, the young Conservatives were abolished in 1998 by William Haig after their members embarrassed leadership with extreme right-wing policies and drunken balls. And then its successor organisation, Conservative Future, was wrapped up in 2015, and I'm sure some of the, 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 the viewers will remember this, amid a bullying scandal, Mark Clark, uh, and uh, a, a suicide by a young man, I believe, called Elliot Johns. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, you've got the stuff from the early 1980s, the hang Nelson Mandela stuff, calling the ANC, uh, here we go, Nelson Mandela and all ANC terrorists, they are butchers. Which, to be fair, was fairly in line with Thatcher's own view. It wasn't that... I mean, also the ANC from were the mainstream of yeah. conservative opinion at that time. The ANC also were a terrorist organisation, right? Yeah, no, they were considered a terrorist organisation. They were back in the day, and they became a civil rights organisation, but they still had just cause, and apartheid was wrong. Um, so yes, there's a broader context here, which is that the Conservatives can't really have a, a, a grassroots youth movement, because it either ends up in drunken bacchanalia, uh, text message racism, uh, or bullying. So they have a problem. They do have a problem. They have a problem. Uh, and whilst the Labour membership is getting younger and growing, broadly speaking, the Tories are getting smaller and ageing. Anyway. Time for a break? Time for a break. Uh, we are going to cut to our Navarra 40k fundraiser. If you want to be part of a new media for a different politics, go to support.navarramedia.com. We will be back in just a few moments with the one and only Richard Angel and Michael Walker. So don't go away. <laughs> Over the last 10 years, things have really changed. Victory for real people. Us. It's about us. But for all of the darkness, every cause has an effect. 40 years on the roof of Melbank. <laughs> For all the talk of change, the present moment is really one of crisis. A crisis of democratic representation. Of identity. A climate crisis. Of a failing economic model which isn't working for most people. We can't have a media that's beholden to advertisers or the political ambitions of oligarchs. Which is why, in 2013, we founded Navarra Media. Unlike corporate media, we are funded by our subscribers. There's no tax avoiders, there's no oil money, and there's no lords. What we're creating is media for you, which quite simply, you make possible. We're looking to raise £40,000. That will allow us to not only keep on paying our contributors, but give them a little bit more, as well as keep our studio and take our fantastic Navarra events nationwide. To help us get there, go to support.navarramedia.com and give a one-off donation, or even better, sign up for a subscription. We've already achieved so much, but the truth is, we've barely started. Wait, look, we're live again now, and you're bickering. Oh no, we're live. <laughs> 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 okay, um, we're joined now by, of course, a resident uh, Labour Party expert within the Navarra Media crew. Yeah. Just for you know, we have to obviously say that <laughs> we are. This is this is not objective. There's a two small different team, points of I'm view. A specialist on yes. the... <laughs> uh, Michael Walker, the one and only Michael J S Walker. Yeah, on Twitter. On Twitter. And of course, Richard Angel. Hello, Richard. Hello. Hi, hi, director hi. of Progress. Yeah. Director. And your ha uh, hashtag, your handle. R at Richard Angel. There you go. And Progress, progress Online yeah. with a zero. No. Is that? Just oh. a capital. Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, I'm so, sophisticated. 
There you go. I'm looking at the screen and it's another one of those situations where I'm next to someone who looks too similar to me in terms of like hairstyle. <laughs> what can you do anyway? <laughs> Brother from another mother. We were yeah, 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 initially going to do a spoof in case you change your mind on it, it and it would have to be in a board cap and being like, hello, yes, I am Richard Angel. Um, so I thought I would kick off with the first question, cool. if that's okay. So would you describe yourself as a Blairite? Is that a fair... Oh, a, um, a reforming Blairite, maybe. A reforming the, the, Blairite? Um, you can't be a modernizer and look back to the past. So the... Uh, I got, I, there's not an ism that I would go forward with, but a social democrat that thinks that our values will still be the best way of shaping so, the country. So a, reform, a reforming Blairite, because my question for you is one, so as I think lots of our viewers know, but in case uh, scurrilous rumours have gone about, I am not a Labour Party member. Shame on um, you. What has Corbyn not done for you to join? He's not Beyonce. Good question. Not Beyonce. Right, so not listen, right, I've got a God. very I agree with Richard. Why haven't you joined the Labour Party? Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn is not Beyonce. Is one, I'm an anarchist, <laughs> and two, he's not Beyonce, which I think are two very strong reasons. But my question is that, like, if I accept for the sake of argument that to, go, that to contest another election on a robustly socialist, hard-left platform would be disastrous, either in terms of getting the votes needed to win an election or if you know, we got into government, would be disastrous for the country. How would you propose addressing what I think of as a potentially irreparable breakdown in public trust in a Blairite or indeed reforming Blairite ideology following the Iraq war and the global financial crisis? This idea of, you know, centrism has been discredited in many people's eyes. So what's your strategy for addressing this? I firstly just don't believe that is true. I think the last Labour government was a huge success. It changed this country in brilliant and measurable ways. It changed my life and the whole trajectory of my life. I'm from a single parent family. The Labour government changed the rules that meant we could have our first family holiday, get more money in our household. And then, of course, as a young gay man growing up, I saw that Labour government change the law in my favour time and time again in a way that went against the Murdoch press and against the establishment of the right, against the House of Lords. It was a huge I mean, reform government. So it of course, had a... the backing of the Murdoch press. Pardon? I mean, Labour did. Labour did, but it went to get... It went, no, no, no. It had the support of the Murdoch press to get elected. It even got the, uh, the Daily Mail at times because it was so popular in the country that they had to follow their readers. But they were advising us, uh, or, or the Labour government, I wasn't part of it, I was much too young at the time, to not do series of things not least on gay rights. And we ignored them at every point and pressed ahead with it. And it changed my life. But you talk about centrism having failed. Macron has just won in France. Hillary Clinton was so close to having had a brilliant result and had certain things gone very, very differently as she has rehearsed in her book that came like out this week. Like had Bernie won, perhaps? No, but there's no evidence that Bernie would have gone through and won uh, a general election in America. No evidence at all. Um, and I think he would have, you know, he never had a negative ad run against him ever. And but Hillary you, Clinton's had but, a career but, of that. But you don't think that, you know, the Iraq war and the global financial crisis are too... I mean, I think that focusing on, you know, the good things that a Labour government can do is, of course, really important. That's how you go out and you make an argument. Um, and I come from a relatively similar background to you. My family knows that it is different to have a Labour government in power. I come from a single parent family as well. But also I come from a family of public sector workers, mostly social workers. And even before the austerity agenda, they were suffering in no, terms of the were... ability to deliver oh, services, particularly in social work, <laughs> in terms of cutbacks to frontline workers. No, that was something well, look, that was happening. All governments and in have terms to live of... within their means. And a Corbyn government couldn't spend every penny. But I'm asking... wouldn't give every interest group what they wanted. I'm, I'm not saying this is saying pro Corbyn. I'm saying that there are there are problems of public perception, right? And you're saying that these are misguided perceptions. But how are you going to address that? Because you can't just lay all the blame at Corbyn's door and say, "Well, he no, won't not, do no, it no, for no. you." You do have to address the fact that the Iraq War has made people feel that a new Labour government or a centrist Blair government would be unaccountable, PR savvy, but not particularly engaged with the will of the people. 
And from the legacy of 2008 onwards, that a neoliberal economic agenda, even when softened by uh, some of the uh, political apparatuses of social democracy, would fundamentally leave us all worse off in the long run. How will you address those two major breakdowns in public trust? Well, there's a lot of things going on there. Firstly, by 2008, there wasn't a Blairite in charge of the country. It was quite a significant change that had happened. Secondly, if you think that what Gordon Brown did as a direct response to the kind of neoliberalism as well, actual liberalism as it would have been in the 1930s, did a markedly different response to the global financial crisis and kept half a million people in, in work. That had huge consequences, but it was worth doing. It was worth doing in a Labour way. It was worth being in government to respond to that crisis in a way that could reflect our values and keep working class people in their, their, their jobs. The reality is, is that if you look at the result of the 2010 election, we deprived the Tories of majority. Had we had somebody as Prime Minister who wanted to keep Labour's net as broad as possible, we arguably would have won that election in 2010. And then all the series of things that followed of Ed Miliband getting elected, trashing the record and Corbyn taking over wouldn't have happened and things could have been very different. So I mean, let's pick up from the crisis because I think we probably all agree to an extent that it changed the rules of the game somewhat. Maybe we disagree around the extent. Um, Although the right have been the only beneficiaries of it really so far. Other than the That's Obama not the true. Mm. But I don't know, I think well, so far, austerity has been the has been the winning story. I, I'd agree with that to an extent. But what I would say is, uh, Blairism was a success for a number of reasons. One of which was it responded to the economic situation of the late 1990s, which is rising prosperity, upturn in um, global capitalism, healthy growth. The major Clark administration prior to that had actually been quite good on the deficit, getting the deficit down, quite responsible. Actually, the only surpluses the Tories run, I think the Tories run maybe four surpluses between. 79, 97, I think maybe two or three of them were under the major government. It's quite responsible. What <laughs> quite, did I just quite, say? quite responsible government. So what I'm saying is that the Blair project is a response to rising wages, uh, the coming online of buy to let mortgages, uh, of an upturn in global capitalism, and after 2008, that changes. And the Blairite project is based upon, yes, there'll be growing inequality, but the, and this was happening. But the pie will be getting bigger, so working people will have rising living standards. But it wasn't that, just that. But that's we not, that, energetically no, no. held the gap between rich but, and poor, but the, closed, but the, in a way that everywhere else it was getting wider no, I agree, than me, in all the years before it had. That's phenomenal. No, no, I agree with you to an extent. So it's the Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality in this country, despite rising GDP, didn't get bigger in the 10 years. Now, I agree with that. That's it's actually, phenomenal. And it's quite, you know, I agree with you. Brazil's done a little bit quite similar under... Slightly different context. Yeah, but it's, I agree with you. It's quite Probably unique. But the point is... And I think well, this is building on what Ash has said, is that first and foremost, there's a, a PR problem, so to speak. Even if you think you're right... Oh, I accept that, Even yeah. if you are right, there's clearly misgivings within the broader yeah. public about Blairism as a political economy and as a, as a set of foreign policy decisions. And then it, I would say, in addition to the impression problem, is that you guys, uh, on that wing of the party, still haven't really come to terms with the reality of a post-crisis world, which is where living standards are always going to go down, productivity is going to be flat, unless we fundamentally transform our economy. And I don't see that coming at the moment. That might change from your wing of the party. But I don't think that's true. The Ed Miliband, I think, did a really good thing for the Labour Party that reminded that the rules of the game are ultimately what matters most. Public services can do a great job in redistributing the proceeds of growth, but how the growth happens and who is immediately given the proceeds of growth through wages rather than dividends is absolutely crucial and almost has given us our confidence back in having that conversation. And we've been having that progress. Liam Byrne MP has been leading brilliant work on this with now an all-party group in Parliament and got the Archbishop of Canterbury to be like the leading voice on reforming capitalism. What was interestingly was almost missing from the Corbyn manifesto this year was any of that stuff. There was the renationalisations, there was a transfer of money, often to very middle class people through tuition fees, etc. What there wasn't was a real shake-up of how the rules uh, get changed. And what's interesting about our approach in difference to both Ed Miliband and Corbyn that's come after, is there are allies in business who want to do this with us. And if you work with them, if you get into the nitty gritty of how capitalism works, we can change it and make it work for our people in politics. Just letting it be passive to what's happening or wanting to go to war with it, neither of those things will work. Michael. Uh I'm obviously going to disagree with most of that. I mean, in terms of policy, I mean, obviously it would be ridiculous to say that people's lives in Britain didn't improve under New Labour, especially compared to what would have been the Tory alternative. But it is difficult to brush over the millions of people whose lives were destroyed in the Middle East, and that is partly through that mode of government, which was you, having you, a you... fairly unaccountable leadership. Uh, in a broader point, I think we can focus a lot on strategy, no, sorry, a lot on policy in terms of sort of like 
how does this and that affect the Gini coefficient? I really think what defines centrism, which is what I think of as progress, is its relationship to political strategy and politics more broadly. So I think you've sort of said Tony Blair challenged the power of Rupert Murdoch. I think that's patently untrue. Um, and I don't, really, I don't really think he... Said no. I don't think he challenged the power really of anyone, which is why the working class are in such a weak position come 2010. I think the new Labour position was from a quite reasonable point of saying that working class power is quite weak in Britain, popular power is quite weak in Britain, we're going to have to try and make a difference at the margins by getting people in power to agree with what we're doing. And I think they quite systematically tried to have a policy platform that the City of London liked, that the corporate media liked, and that worked for a while, but when the pie stopped growing, that broke down. I think for a number of reasons, people aren't going to go back to centrism, which is, one, it seems less plausible that that kind of politics, which is completely accommodating to the corporate media and to the financial interests, can continue to improve our lifestyles. And two, that we don't have to settle for that anymore. So I think one reason that centrism was quite attractive, especially within the Labour Party, was the idea that the working class is weak, uh, popular power is weak, so we're going to have to go begging to corporate power. People look at the world now and they say, we don't, have to, we don't have to settle for that. We are actually strong enough now, as a popular movement, to take on those vested interests. And that means that we can improve public services without public-private finance and without indebting our services for years and without meaning that the minute we go out of government, it's still corporations that have power and they can stop throwing us the crumbs. I mean, we started I... the 80s with 12 million people and ended it with 6 million people. And... Uh, sorry, uh, many people in trade unions, for example. Like, working class power was at its height at the point in which Labour was getting the fewest votes they, they in the country. Really so really. those things don't correlate. No, my the basic premise of your argument there just doesn't correlate. Michael, quickly, well, and then Ash. So, Michael, oh, Michael, Michael, quickly. Well, well, the, the point of my argument is, yes, the reason Labour got into power then was because they accepted that working class power was quite weak, and so they went for a strategy which was to win over corporations. Now, what the Corbyn movement shows, what Bernie Sanders shows, what Podemos show is that actually we have a very politicised population, much more than it was in 1997, and we don't anymore have to settle for an elitist strategy which has a policy and politics based on what Rupert Murdoch will and will not accept. But Bernie so, came second I mean, in the... Actually, in the, in the so I, I want to come in because I actually want to give Michael a bit of a hard time. Ooh. Um, <laughs> That's not what we agreed, Ash. <laughs> I mean, it sounds exciting. <laughs> um, so, I mean, on this thing about, like, it is undeniable that Corbyn has energised sections of the population course, yeah. to get involved with the Labour Party who normally wouldn't. And I'm coming at this from the perspective of lots of my friends growing up who are, like, young people of colour, look at politics as something that's completely removed from their lives. And I think you would struggle to see, say, a figure like Liz Kendall as Labour and getting the endorsements of Stormzy, Jamie, Novelist, mm -hmm. AJ Tracy, young working class people of colour who and are... Yeah, yeah. Even. I'm talking about people who are cool. No, but you know, if we're talking like <laughs> cultural figures. Like... <laughs> oh, like, oh. Anyway, if you're watching this, like I saw Ray Galang, I saw a banger. Um, but you, you wouldn't have those figures come out. And they've also undertaken what I think of as a really important project, which is one of political education, where our governments weren't doing it, our schools weren't doing it. You had Jamie telling people how to register to vote, and I thought that was a really wonderful thing. What I worry about in the Corbyn projects and also lots of the kind of internal tussles within momentum and now all this stuff about deselections, reselections, is that first and foremost, it's incredibly boring. Mm -hmm. It seems really opaque. It's about all these internal mechanisms that I don't really understand. I also feel like I don't necessarily care to understand it a lot of the time. And... You know, it seems like internal bickering, which risks sucking the energy and the vibrancy out of a young, energetic mm -hmm. political movement. So by carping on about this all the time, don't you it's risk true. alienating us? For a start, Ash, I'm very offended that you've seen all my episodes of Party Time and you still think <laughs> rule changes are boring. Because the whole point of that was to make it really sexy and cool. I never watched the <laughs> bit where you stopped dancing. That was the sexy and cool bit. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the rules themselves are what's inspiring, but I do think that for us to have a Labour Party which is 
which fulfills the expectations and the desires of the hundreds of thousands of people that have been inspired by a more radical program, which raises expectations. That's why I'm interested in a politics that raises expectations, not which is the centrism one, the Hillary Clinton one, which is to say that that's very difficult to do, that's impossible, that would be nice, but it's basically a pony, which is what she says in her, her book with Bernie Sanders, well, not with Bernie Sanders, about Bernie Sanders. Uh, we need to, yeah, we need a politics that does that. And I think to do that, we need a Labour Party which really represents those members and which lets new members take positions which are front and centre, which lets the most inspirational people become MPs, people who are embedded in their communities. And I want there to be real contests every time we select an MP, uh, because I think that it should be seen as a privilege, not as a job for life. And that's why... It's about mandatory reselection. This is about mandatory reselection, but it's also about many things. So at the Labour Party conference, which I think we've segued into, uh, there will be many... <laughs> there will be... There'll be many rule changes. And what I talk about like, on party time or when I'm in the pub is how important it is to make sure the movement that Jeremy Corbyn started can't be shut down by bureaucratic mechanisms which don't buy into his project. We still know that a majority of the PLP, the Parliamentary Labour Party, don't buy into the Corbyn project. We know that most of the staff don't buy into the Corbyn project. And that's ridiculous in a movement where we have hundreds of thousands of talented passionate people embedded in their communities. We don't need these wonks from above anymore. I mean, Richard, Michael, that's all brilliant and passionate, but total nonsense. The NEC decide tomorrow the rule changes that go to conference. Corbyn's office haven't even published the paper that sets out what the rule changes are. They've literally done the stitch and fix. Now, it took New Labour years and years in office to get to a point where they had to, like, stitch over things to get through them. You've done them within basically but, weeks comparatively. You've got con total control of the Labour Party, a majority on the NEC. You can't even publish the paper that outlines what the rule changes are. And you've got all these members that are supposed to be engaged in the process. It's nonsense. Hang on, so what's this thing about the NEC? Yeah. I don't understand. Well, so the Nationalist Spell Committee, there's, there's two ways. You do <laughs> the most democratic way, where you go to your local party, they pro propose the rule change, it goes to a conference, not the next year, but one after. So that's where the McDonnell Amendment started in CLPs over yep. a year ago, and it's gone forward. Or the NEC can come in and go, we want you to decide this. And not only is that happening this year, it's only uh, Corbyn's office haven't even published to the NEC, let alone to half a million members out there, what those rule changes they're seeking to change. So they want to have changes to the Labour Party constitution that could last forever, and they might not have been published for more than seven days before they get voted on at conference. That's the stitch and fix. You're worse than right, anything that on, Alistair Campbell but, did. But can it, can it clean up the party for Blair? I mean, Blair literally didn't need to do these things because they'd been oh, done by his predecessors. That's not the true. Of the, they, well, the first thing that Blair did was Richard, do Clause 4, true. for God's sake. Like, it's true. And 160 events around the country, right? <laughs> the, the Clause 4 was a consultation <laughs> with Labour Party people when the party membership had 400,000 members at the time. I agree so, with you about, you know, you know people, in politics, people play hard and fast, which is what ha is happening. But I didn't need to do that because Kinnock had done it for that's, 10 years. But that's I've not got a simpler answer true. that doesn't require any <laughs> Labour Also, Party John history. Lansman knows more about this stuff than anyone else on the NEC does. We've read about the so, Independent, so, but not... <laughs> But not, so not so in, terms saying, in, in terms okay. of you saying that you are all in danger of alienating yeah. the like newly energised. But the point uh, is, people love Macron. Yeah, people, <laughs> love Macron. People, people also love Labour Party internal rule change gossip. I so, swear. Um, to make it to break down what's going on, right? So tomorrow, and what you're talking about in terms of a stitch question, up. Okay? Tomorrow there is an NEC meeting that can decide what rule changes they want to put to conference. Uh, these aren't rule changes which concentrate power, or the ones that the leadership are likely to recommend, are not rules which concentrate power in the leadership. They are, all of them, rules which would give the membership more power vis-a-vis -vis the party bureaucracy. How do you know about the rules before members of the NEC do? Because we've all read the John Landsman interview. We also did a podcast. You should listen to it last Friday. So, so Navarra, Media, <laughs> Navarra, Media Navarra Media and the com. owner of Momentum knows more about the <laughs> yeah. rule changes that are coming which, than the members of the NEC do. Three which three is that, is, that is not the stitch and fix. Well, then what it is, come on. <laughs> I'm up for having a laugh about this party time <laughs> stuff, but that is a stitch up. Richard. You have a whole tap in front of you soon. Okay, let's move on. Broadly got yeah. the grasp on this. Uh, I think I've seen somewhere where you describe yourself as a socialist. Oh, I'm not sure about that. No, you, so you I call, don't think so. No, no, so you'd call yourself a social democrat. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's a... So the party... The, the, Labour, party, the Labour Party yeah, is, a, it or not. is a coalition of, let's say, liberals, social democrats, socialists. Always has been. Yeah. Do you think that coalition can hold tight? It has done for 120 years. I don't see any problem with it. Well, that's not true. I mean, it's split twice, right? In the middle. <laughs> <laughs> well, <not really. laughs> it has to happen. No, no, well, it's a, in a it's significant a... way. No, I mean that's because the people doing it didn't achieve what they set out to do. But 
you know, there's no splits. There's no, that's not going to happen. I don't like. I'm labour through and through. Right. The only split, you know, if you if you break me like a, yeah. you know, a piece of rock, it says labour through the middle. Like, so it's totally in, a in context, our DNA. In a, in a context of declining productivity, declining wages, stagnant growth, what does social democracy mean? Well, it, it means at the moment staying in the single market, which is the best response to austerity that we can have. It will be plunged into a. Uh, a worse version of austerity if we're outside that bit of the single market. It means the power collectively to deal with the race at the bottom. And that's one of the things that the social market is very good at, by being in part of that conglomerate. It means we can't trade away our rights um, uh, with global companies because our nearest neighbours doing the same thing as well. But it also means rebuilding our public services. But it's, it's not a, the glib answer that more money will be the only answer. It's that there are innovations that can happen. There's ways that our public services can be better and stronger. And I think it's believing that a more equal society makes us all more equal. And you've got to do that not by doing it against the people who might currently feel that they're privileged, but by showing that we can do this together. What was so great about the gay rights agenda that, that New Labour did is they were ahead of the public and they had a lasting change with the public is they weren't doing it just for the gays. It wasn't like, if you talk, look at the debate in Australia now they're having on equal marriage, it's like a transfer of rights onto gay people, a disaster. The way New Labour did it was like, we are all stronger if we do this together. And that majoritarian form of equality is one that we can all get on board I with mean, and I think the British public will vote for. I, I think that's a, a historical reading of how LGBT movements have worked in terms of like from the grassroots. I think that New Labour were able to come in after grassroots movements were able to construct a tipping point. And on this, about the relationship between Labour and liberta uh, sorry, uh, liberation movements, um, having a look over the stuff about the anti-Semitism proposal, I'm not really sure, uh, like, is this a new bit in, like, uh, the Constitution, so or does this just so mean new moment, powers? You could, the only thing you can really do wrong in the Labour Party is stand against it in an election or call it into disrepute in some way, right? And, but if you, ha if you say something that's racist, you can use the defence in the Labour Party rulebook of, I believe it really strongly, and can essentially get away with it. And sadly, many people have. And what the attempt by JLM and others, the Jewish Labour Movement, sorry, and others is, is to say there should be a rule that says, if you are found to be racist, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, and as well as that, homophobic, etc., you should be able to kick out. We're the pie of equality. That should mean something, and, and we should police our so, own borders. And so my, my, uh, my question is this. And so this is also another reason why I'm not in the Labour Party, which is a kind of uh, analysis of racism and how it functions through institutions, where it's not just about someone calling you a name or saying something offensive, because if that was just what racism was, it would have been over in the 1980s when my mum was at a prime fighting age, because, like, Mama Saka could throw a hook, <laughs> right? It's about policy. And, I'm, and I fully back measures which you know, make political parties more welcoming and inclusive places for people of colour, people from religious minorities, people who are LGBT, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But what mechanisms are there other than expulsion to hold people to account? And the reason why I'm saying this mm -hmm. is to take two uh, recent examples in terms of something that I feel very strongly about. One is Jess Phillips's comments about uh, Bangladeshis and Pakistan, sorry, the Bangladeshi Pakistani community, which hasn't existed since 1971, by the way, um, importing. <laughs> the fucking war. I mean, yeah, I was, I was just like, yeah. <laughs> it, much a community. That was kind of a beef about this. Um, importing brides to, um, for their disabled sons. And the second one, and this is where I'm saying that simply saying, well, you're no longer part of this project, it was, I think, sometimes ineffective, is with Sarah Champion. Because I think they both parroted deeply Islamophobic and deeply incendiary myths. And what my problem is, is that when you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if you just say, like, we're going to expel these people, there's not really time, I think, to do the real work of heavy lifting and debunking lots of these narratives. Because I think, you know, um, you achieve change not just through getting rid of something, but by challenging it. So if you have this policy of, like, we will expel you if you are found to be Islamophobic. Well, what about the kind of Islamophobia that's written through, you know, kind of every, you know, line of scripture in our politics currently? What about the anti-Semitism, which doesn't just shape how do people relate to Jewish people on an individual level, but colours how they think, say, capitalism and power all works? How do you challenge those deeply held myths? But if you look what happened with Naz Shah, that was, the, that was how the rules can work well, is she did something 
She accepted that she'd done it wrong. She went forward and said, I want to be better at this. She got put in front of the Labour Party procedures. There was a consequence to her actions and she took all the right routes for, for doing that the other way. What you then saw was Ken Livingston come on the telly and mansplain her and say she was wrong to apologise, she was wrong to do this. Let me tell you my warped version of history. And that's the most bizarre thing. And then not only does he get basically get upheld as having called the Labour Party into disrepute, that, that they decide that he should have the most lenient punishment for doing that. And he goes out and basically sticks two fingers up to the British Jewish community and to Labour Party members who find that abhorrent and goes through the whole cycle again. That's bizarre. So it can work. And now Shah showed the right way to do it. It's on the on yeah. behalf of the person, isn't it, with Nash Shah, for instance, yeah. right? But that's it's, not good enough for leadership. justice. It's that's leadership. not good enough. With justice, it's not dependent upon the goodwill of the... It can't be dependent on the goodwill of the uh, well, it, it depends the person, if you, if you want to constantly go for the grievance, and if, if, if we think the best thing was just her for be, to be punished publicly, I think it is much better that she's been embraced by her local Jewish community, that she's gone on a journey, she showed the leadership role, but she hasn't fundamentally changed her view on the Middle East and who the and what, you know, what the injustices that are happening are. That seems to me to be, and the problem with Sarah Champion was the shadow equalities minister shouldn't need telling that language matters. Mm -hmm. But also statistics matter. Of course, of course, yeah. right? of course. That right. statistics I mean, for 40. I think that rule change will probably go through fairly uncontroversially. It does seem like an absence in the rule book that you can't be, that having a racist view doesn't, exclude, doesn't preclude you being a member of the Labour Party, it probably should. Uh, in terms of how do we make this a broader conversation than what I think this would likely be, which is that you have a bureaucratic body at the top which polices racism at its most extreme, when it's most explicit, when someone says a slur, which is necessary, I mean, we absolutely need that, is a party which is more democratically accountable from the bottom up. So at the moment, what you have in Labour is if someone's elected as a councillor or elected as an MP in a safe seat, uh, then the whole party bureaucracy sort of encircles them and helps them keep that position. And it means that MPs feel fairly free to say whatever they like, whoever they piss off. And it's very, very difficult to get rid of them. So in the case of Jess Phillips or Sarah Champion, uh, I don't think either of them necessarily... Theirs weren't slurs, so I don't think that's a case for disciplining someone. But I think it might well be something that members might want to take into account when they have an open process for who they want to represent them next time round. Maybe it will be Jess Phillips and Sarah Champion again, or maybe they'll pick uh, in just in Sarah Champion's constituency, someone who's campaigned against grooming and also works with the Muslim community, for example. There might be people who point. are better positioned to have that conversation than those people. I mean, but the, the free voters in her area have just re-elected her. What, what respect the, do you show to them for their role? Six percent of people vote for the Labour candidate because of the person. Most people vote because of the party and the platform. Well, I think in lots if of you places, live, that is the difference whether you have Labour MP or not. So look, yeah, but, we've already got the hardest challenge, right? If you're progressive, the job is never done, right? You've the, you've got to keep working, and you want our people to go into that fight having a contest the Tories don't have. The minute they're selected, they never have to look over it's their totally shoulder. Not. Right? You have it so in America. It's harder already for a, a Labour MP concerned to... Concerned. Mm -hmm. You're not change of a change in the law, you're change of campaign for a change in Labour Party rules. So yeah. you want Labour to be, have one hand mm -hmm. behind its back the way its Tory MP opponent does. Secondly, when the big task is reforming capitalism, which I think we can all agree is a pretty difficult Mine's thing... overthrowing it. ...to do. OK, fine. Well, <laughs> uh, somewhere in that spectrum, you're not in the Labour Party with all due respect, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> is, the, um, it, it, is that that's pretty difficult, right? I want our Labour MPs to read a book, start with Paul Mason's maybe. It takes a bit of time to get through it, right? But otherwise, you want them to spend all their time going to branch I mean, secretaries can I, can I, can I, and... I know we're back on rule changes. Can I just respond in 60 seconds? No. <gasps> Give me... I want 30... I want 30... 30 more, seconds. Go on. All right. So I think you're saying, just let people vote for the Labour no, candidate. That gives them less choice over what candidate they're going to pick. You're either saying, pick our Labour candidate, this one who's been your Labour candidate for 15 years, or vote for the Tories or Lib Dems. That's not offering ordinary people a choice. I also think that the fact that you've had people in these safe seats who haven't had any challenge is one of the reasons why, in many parts of Britain, people feel detached. Actually, in all parts of Britain, people have felt very detached from the Labour Party because they have seen it as unresponsive. That's why if you have challenges in communities and they can continuously select people who currently reflect their views, you're going to have greater connection to the Labour Party and will be far more successful electorally than having this sort of idea that we have to spend the whole four years sending out leaflets because any internal contest but would put people this off. What proves that, Michael, is in Scotland when we were swept away, we were not disproportionately swept away because Katie Clark was the MP or not. So when you had a hard left MP who apparently, under your definition, would be more yeah, engaged I... or whatever, there was no difference because what happened was bigger than that. So She wasn't selected in a, in a very dynamic open selection where there was a party with half a million members. 
I think that it could have made a difference. Time she was selected. Labour had 400,000 members back me, in 97. So, like, wanna, come on, these things don't come flow. Labour won 3.5 million extra votes in the last general election. They increased their share of the vote. Look, I was an optimist. I didn't, I didn't expect that, right? Mm. They increased their share of the vote by 9.6%. Now, looking back to the, uh, the second leadership race, I like to think of it, with Owen Smith last summer, I simply believe Labour would not have done that well had there not been the coup, OK? And I don't think this, this perennial, and it would mean literally a permanent campaigning. I don't think that, in that means one hand behind your back. Actually, I think it would make us far better as a campaigning organisation and we'd be far better equipped at general elections. The evidence from the 2016 sort of leadership race to this June would suggest that. And I, I would, but it wouldn't be, I would, well, I would claim that. The Labour MPs are really quite good at what they do. They defied the odds in 2010 when the Tories were supposed to sweep the country. Depends on part of the country. Depends on part of the country. In Labour London, MPs, absolutely. In Labour MPs, MPs have horrific judgment. In London, absolutely. <laughs> Look at 2016, when 172 of them wanted to get rid of the most successful Labour politician we've had since Tony Blair. Uh, he's added... Yeah, Three point five million people. Get rid of Tony Blair all the way through before he was successful. While he was I don't think he should have power either. I don't. I don't Richard, think. I don't want my guy to have power. For the record, I want for the masses for the record, to have power. For the record. I think Michael and I are probably like yeah. The first Blair term, it's okay. I mean, we're not like that. But, that, but, but Corbyn like, would have got rid of. We're not saying Corbyn though. should have picked the whole time. We're saying the <laughs> members should pick all the time because there is what this election has proved is the wisdom of crowds when you let. Half a million people a, decide. This is a bit too liberal for me. No, when, you make, when you let half a million people decide, <laughs> they make too a better decision. Valid. A bit too Silicon Valley for me. Than 250 <laughs> oligarchs in the PLP. Corbyn didn't believe in the wisdom of the crown where Blair was being well, successful. Tell, so tell, stop pretending that this is... You've kind of created an alternative reality. I'm not interested where, in what Corbyn fought right in 1997. I'm interested in okay. membership democracy. I don't I, care what Corbyn fought in 97. I've got a question that I want both of you to answer very quickly. We're going to wrap up after this, OK? Can Which, I one more point? No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll bring Rich back in. Okay. okay, right. One question. Which is, I think it would be a terrible error to subsume all political activity and energy into the Labour Party. I think you need lots of things going on at the same time and that's what creates a dynamic, vibrant, pluralistic politics. How can the Labour Party better engage with grassroots liberation movements, ranging from, say, Movement for Justice, which does a lot of work around defending the rights of migrants, which and that's only going to that's only going to become more relevant, what with Brexit going through, to say UK Black Lives Matter or to grassroots um, housing campaigns such as around West London or um, St Anne's, which is around me? And how can Momentum break out of simply being a campaigning organisation to get people elected and start doing that work of embedding, um, you know, a labour left within these kind of neighbourhood grassroots networks? So, But there is a, time is a finite amount, you know, is a finite entity. You either spend it on the internal stitch and fix, defending yourself against the deselection, or you're out in your community engaging with these people. And you know, Labour MPs are working pretty hard. Even the worst ones I've got a good are fact working for you. pretty hard. David so, Miliband, the golden boy of progress, had a 0.5% contact rate in his CLP. And a huge 0. vote. 0.5%. So, that's so because like, the choice was <laughs> Labour, the Lib Dems, no, 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 or the Tories. And anyone would prefer a Labour candidate with David Miliband. The other end of the spectrum, the other patron state of progress politics is someone like Siobhan McDonough, who turned a Tory safe seat into a Labour and safe she, seat. And she worked really hard. We should, if like, she stood for, course, a, for a selection, I'm sure she she'd stand quite a good chance of getting selected then if she was that good. The world was a better place because David Miliband got to be our Foreign Secretary for a while. Like, And that is a really good contribution that we've made to public life. People have got different things to give in different ways. And you've got to allow people to come to the Labour Party with different things at different times. So these people who currently are in the PLP, they have... What they can give to the movement is all the fucking power and everyone no, else not, can knock on some doors no, behind them and hope that not in 30 I've, years when that person dies, they can stand in a selection which is. And is the only person that Ed Miliband ever beat. I mean, come on. <laughs> you guys can do better than that. That is probably true. I would accept that. Can I make one point very quickly? We've talked a lot about the 40% of the vote that Corbyn got, and I think he is absolutely integral to inspiring 40% of the public to vote in Labour. But he was also integral in getting 43% of the public to vote Tory. And what we haven't ever talked about, we talked about the 30 MPs we gained net, we don't talk about the five MPs we lost, we don't talk about why, with the worst Tory MP, uh, Prime Minister, with the worst Tory campaign, an actively voter repellent Tory manifesto, they, their vote went up significantly. A declining party membership, you Brexit. talked about earlier. Because of Brexit. Well, yeah, but you guys but are the first to say that it was a Brexit, Brexit election. <laughs> Brexit isn't that. coming off the table. And it still is. But until you, you deal know, with that, Richard, Brexit you know isn't coming off the there table. Were and there was a dishonesty. Going, and there was a dishonesty of the Labour position that erode both. You know that. Corbyn's the, manifesto the way, saying end free movement way, made Ed Miliband's mug look positively liberal. Come on. The way you frame that saying 
I agree with you that Theresa May, how the hell is she getting circa 40%? I think that's a great way to frame it. But let's be honest. You should ask that question more on Navarre let, Media. But let's be honest. The oh, Tory, believe believe the Tory, me, we yeah, asked that question the Tory a lot on Navarre Media. The ones Bridget, I've watched. The Tory vote you know, was always going to go up dramatically. There is nothing you know he never that. took all about our politics. That's, surely that's hold what on, Corbyn teaches hold on, hold on. us. I'd agree with you too. No, no, I agree Come with you. Most of those people voted Blair in Name 2005. Name me a progress candidate that would have put on 10 points in a six-week campaign. Name me None of us know what would have happened to those people. But they equally inspired some people to vote against us. And until we deal with that... We might be stuck in second place. Because if you're going to put all your faith in the Bernie model, he came second, guys. Corbyn came second. I'm, no, Corbyn. We've got to work oh, out okay, who first. I'm from Bournemouth. You came right? fourth, I'm but... from Bournemouth. In Bournemouth, I think. Bournemouth 4.5%. East, Bournemouth East or Bournemouth West. In 97, we've got 20%. We've just got 36%. Bournemouth, the other Bournemouth uh, constituency, we've got 35%. Well, it's now, Mansfield. I mean, you could, there's always, out, there's there's always that, outliers. We, we there's won there's outliers in 97. Five, that's net. We have to look at the big trends, Richard. I, I accept that's, that's that's net. Net. We have to look at the big trends. And the big trends are Canterbury, Hastings, the South Coast, phenomenal Labour votes, which not even under Blair we had. And I think that's because of a changed capitalism. They got changed, 418 seats. Like, let's not go change, into what Blair had changed, or not. Like, come no, on. No, no, in terms of... If, in terms of the labour market, etc., etc., there are seats where we're competitive now. Under Corbyn, I never thought I'd be saying this, Richard, but it's happening, right? Of course. Which we weren't competitive in 1997. That. So what? I mean, so I think if you look at that, and the, the, yes, we came second, but the hidden story of the last general election is Labour is competitive in about 80 seats, which it really should win at the next general election. And if it doesn't, I'll be the first to say yes, we failed, Richard. But it could have won them in 2010. It should have won them in 2015. But but Michael, because we, we veered off of Michael it. Walker, you've got one more question plan. and then we're going to wrap up. Okay. Cool. One more question. One more thing to say and then we'll wrap up. Oh. I mean, we could be here all night. but that's Yeah, we could point. be here all night. I have a light, um, please. No. I'll make it a good question. <laughs> what I'd say, I don't know if, it's, if it is a time for a question. I mean, what I'd say in, in response say to all of this fine. is that we can have, we're in a position where that campaign was very good. We added 10 points. We're beating the Tories in, a poll, in the polls, considering where we were six weeks previously, I think obviously what we should be doing is building on that politics, not going back to some, I don't know some, some, some abstract, arbitrary politics that hasn't worked for years. Like Hillary Clinton got, but you say Bernie came second. One of the reasons Hillary won was because people thought she could win. Well, people thought she could win and she lost, which is why, which is why she's the least, she's the least popular politician in America because people, people chose her. I mean, because oh. they thought she could win, and she, she lost. Votes. Votes. So she 65 million you, votes. If Come all on, you like, offer, if oh, all you can offer people can, is that you can win, and that we, we might have someone like David there. Miliband, as no, foreign no, no. secretary. Let, let, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. If all you can offer is that you think you're more likely to win, and we can have someone that. like David Miliband as foreign secretary for three years, I don't see your funding model improving and I don't see anyone else joining progress. But you don't, no, no, the actual thing is you don't think it's worth it. Because you don't think it's worth it. You'd rather have I don't a think your government than wait for the perfect Labour government. No, and that's surely wrong. I think if we can... That's I, what you were just saying. I'd prefer to. Though, guys. Look, that's what you no, were saying. Michael finish got, and then Richard and then Nash. Yeah, go on, We've Michael. got, I think, the best chance of us winning the next election is on a radical platform inspiring people, increasing turnout even further. The gain of that is also incredibly big. It's having a politicised population. It's having a government that has people behind it who can actually challenge corporate power, which can give us lasting better public services, not better public services whilst we have the right people pulling the strings. I think looking around the world, looking in Britain over the last two years, that's clearly going to be the most successfully electorally. What you're offering people is a deflated programme, a programme which says we have to be realistic, which means we have to accommodate with word, corporate power, it means yeah. we have to accommodate with corporate power and not scare anyone. Um, and so we're going to have a, a platform which isn't able to challenge vested interests and also doesn't inspire anyone. So I'm looking at winning on a transformative platform or losing on a platform that's kind of embarrassed of what it stands for. But my platform hasn't been put to the public and lost. Like it, wasn't, it wasn't put to the public in 2010 or 2015, which is when we lost. I'm, the, I'm interested the, more the, in your strategy the, than the your The Corbyn platform. project is kind of based on the fact there were three Blairite leaders and it failed. There wasn't. There was one. And then it, we've gone left and left and left. See, and, and it's got, it got the, increasingly worse. Something that people well on your wing of the Labour Party the Tory do party is did think very people well care election. about the difference between Ed Miliband and Gordon Brown. You're, they did. you're they incredibly, the number of votes you're a tiny, tiny section of society and you're always asking people, don't call us centrists because some of us oh, want 6k student fees and some of us want 9k student fees. To everyone in the world, you all look like people who did a social policy masters and now hang out in the same 
NGOs and think tanks and corridors of power in Westminster and the different opinions you have on this or that policy are completely fucking irrelevant because it's, it's within such a tiny margin. I'll, I mean, I'll finish there. I'll bring, I'll bring Ash. And we, we won't cut anybody out. Go on. Ash. Right, so are we going to close you'll up the show now? Or well, yes. Point? Well, Richard needs a closing. We'll bring in that. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah, I, re I reckon that. I re reckon Richard should close this off. I do want to say, for the point of transparency, that the reason why this has been such an energetic debate um, has been Navarra Media brought to you by <laughs> Green Gin and Slim. Gin, Gin and Slim. By request of progress. Uh, I mean, dude, this has really been paid for personally by Ed Miliband, so thank you. One of the things that I... Admit, what, that was no, 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 sorry. I, I paid for that. So I got I got mixed up with my Melibans. I'm so sorry. Michael Walker. But, but what, I will say, what I will say is this, and, um, and again, this is kind of speaking as an outsider, is that there is a tremendous amount of energy at the moment, and I think mm. that sometimes the way that these debates are framed makes it sound like the most... Um, relevant antagonism that exists in politics is between progress and momentum, and frankly, most people like give a fuck, right? The I reason, the reason, like EastEnders. I think most people are kind of, you know, it's kind of like no. I don't think they're kind of like, give a fuck. Have you watched recently? No. no. Yeah, yeah, kind of kind of funny. Funny. Basically, we're we're weird. We're weird. Listen, Ooh, until we're not that weird. <laughs> Listen, we're until someone gets... A couple of million people find it quite interesting. Yeah, That's yeah, a lot yeah, of people. True. Until someone gets murked with an iron <laughs> on New Year's Eve, like, I don't want to know. But the thing is, is that the reason why people are so engaged at the moment, and also that is an engagement which has sustained itself since June, which is another thing which I'm very pleasantly surprised about. And I'm not talking about, you know, politics wonks. I'm talking about actual human beings. Ash, give me a break. You're a politics wonk, OK? Yeah, come on. Yeah. You're a senior editor of fucking, <laughs> like, radical political media project. Give me a break. Yeah, but I also go to the football with. <laughs> Oh gosh, Alison McGovern spends all the time talking about the football. Why is everyone turning on me? Sorry. Why is everyone turning on me? You turned on us. Yeah, you turned on us. You called him Ed Miliband. I was going to mock you by calling you David Miliband, and I called you the wrong Miliband. Okay, do your piece, do your piece, come on. What I'm saying is this is that the reason why people are so engaged is because we can scent blood in the water, right? And we feel that there is a very real possibility of displacing a Tory government. For my money, I don't want it to be with the same kind of watered down, let's reform capitalism, but not really politics that dominated my teenage years and late childhood. I want to see something that looks drastically different, not just from, you know, the kind of late 90s to 2000s, but also the kind of, you know, donkey jacket socialism of the 70s, right? I want it to look different from that as well. I want it to be something that's young, vibrant, and energetic. I think that the parameters of some of these debates inhibits that conversation. It's a conversation fundamentally about possibility. We end up arguing over 2001 when really I think we should be looking forward. I don't think that that project of looking forward is possible with the Labour Party being constructed as it is. I think that there needs to be mechanisms for empowering um, a new, young, engaged membership. I don't think those things exist right now, but then again, don't listen don't to me, I'm an anarchist. But I do know that I literally host attitude. a politics oh, show. You can't comment on it because you haven't paid your membership fees. No, 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 I agree that Ash needs to join. Ash needs to join, obviously. For fuck's sake. You're entitled to opinion even before you do, but come on, you've got six months. I... <laughs> I want to get laid, man. I just don't want to. I don't want to join a political party. I'm not in it for this. Is it? Well, half a million. Let's presume the gender balance is slightly. It's it's about sixty percent men. So no, babe. Just let's talk later. Get your membership card and find your men elsewhere. But it doesn't prohibit it. That's my advice. That's only my advice. So Richard, is there anything else you want to say? Well, look, we're at the moment feeling a bit down about things. I think that's fair enough. That you know, our politics feels like. It maybe hasn't got all the answers. It certainly hasn't got all the energy behind it. But I don't think you should say that we're down and out and completely uh, 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 not there. I think there are, I think ultimately we will win back uh, the Labour Party with some ideas that show themselves to be both absolutely valuable um, and, and going to change this country, but show that there is a plan for doing it and that we can bring the most number of people with us. That it matters, yes, how many people vote for us, but how many people vote for the other side, particularly when they're so repugnant. And look, I get we feel on the back foot, but it, 
when, when people are on the back foot, you shouldn't necessarily round in to try and finish them off. And that's what this conference feels like, is momentum have got the advantage. They feel that they've got the numbers. They're doing it all cloak and dagger, very much the old politics that they promised to end. And they're going to try and use this co conference to push their advantage. And I think that if they believe in the unity they were calling for before the election, they wouldn't be doing that. And if they wanted the kind of project that was focused on what you said, of replacing a Tory government, that wouldn't be the focus of this conference. It would be the manifesto and policy, not process and constitutional amendments. 10 seconds. Michael, very quickly. Yeah. Richard, we don't want to drive you out of the party. I think there's a place Some for progress do. in the party. I think I want a grand... The fact you have to say want, that is quite I want, worrying. I want a grand compromise oh. where the PLP represent, reflects the membership, reflects all the membership in its broad church. 60% are Corbynite, 4.5% are progress, and 30% are somewhere in between. I will strike that deal now. It's about 30 what about days. the public? Where are the public in any of your cap? No, no. The public don't know who the fuck you are. Like, <laughs> literally, <laughs> the public right, do not so know. Like, or, or us, but no, I mean... The, be fair to Richard. Come on, man. <laughs> where are the public or in any of that? But I mean, where are the voters? Where are the free okay. voters? That, that was that was my ten seconds. Go on, Aaron. You're, you're... Okay. Well, I think my view is who, who, uh, other than McDonald thing. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to you. Um, yes. For my money, um, Labour has to be a coalition to win. We can probably all agree on that. The idea that we can have like a revolutionary socialist. I don't believe that for one second. At the same time, I think that if the political energies, which have clearly come from the left, universalism. Uh, some of the classical policies of social democracy, if they were to be undermined by a desire to build bridges with other elements of the party, I think that would deprive us of momentum rather than accelerate it. Just my view, but Richard, takes Bottler. Yeah. The, yeah. the Lion's Dead. Thank you so much for coming on. The Lion's Dead. Uh, this is The Fix. Um, we will be back... A at, lot. At, we'll be <laughs> at, we will be broadcasting next Monday, but also next Saturday, Sunday and choose them with it. You'll get your daily fix of the fix exactly. at lunch times, I think we agreed, we'll be broadcasting. Yeah. But circle one, two, but we'll, we'll confirm that later on. 1 p.m., uh, we've got interviews this week out uh, with, uh, too much uh, gin and slimmer. <laughs> <laughs> we've got interviews this week out with Angela Nagel and David Harvey, so keep uh, tuned for that. We will, uh, yeah, we'll see you at conference. Bye. Bye.